Climate change. A term we hear frequently, and a term that is deemed as one of the defining geographical issues of our time. But what does it truly mean in a geographical context? In Topic 2 of the Climate Cluster, we'll delve into the intricacies of climate change, exploring its natural and human-induced causes, its profound impacts on both natural and human systems, and how this knowledge is crucial for your ONN-level geography examinations. So what is climate change? Climate change refers to significant alterations in global or regional climate patterns over extended periods. Climate change is not a new phenomenon. The Earth has naturally cycled through ice ages and warmer interglacial periods over hundreds of thousands of years. But how do we know this when humans weren't around to record it? Scientists rely on a powerful method called isotope analysis particularly oxygen isotopes found in ice cores and ocean sediment layers, to reconstruct past climates. Here's how it works. Oxygen has multiple isotopes, the most common being oxygen-16 and oxygen-18. Scientists analyze records and determine the ratio between both isotopes over time. A higher O18-O16 ratio typically signals a colder glacial period, while a lower ratio indicates a warmer interglacial period. Now, let's visualize this. Typically, at lower latitudes nearer to the equator, intense solar radiation heats up the Earth's water surface, facilitating the process of evaporation. As water evaporates, lighter oxygen isotopes, the O16, evaporates more readily due to the lower mass as compared to the heavier O18. This explains why the ocean has a higher concentration of O18. As the water vapor, richer in O16, rises, cools, and condenses to from clouds, they are carried by the atmospheric circulation system to move polewards. While moving polewards, the process of evaporation continues, further increasing the concentration of O16 within the clouds. Over time, the water droplets in the clouds become too heavy and dense, eventually depositing themselves as precipitation back into the ocean. Picture this. Water droplets that fall as precipitation are primarily O18 due to their heavier mass. This results in a higher concentration of O18 in the oceans. As the clouds approach higher latitudes in the polar regions, the O16 rich vapor falls as snow onto the ice sheets. Since ice sheets remain frozen for extended periods of time, the O16 isotopes remain trapped in the ice sheets in the polar regions. So, how do scientists conclude that the Earth has naturally cycled through ice ages and warmer interglacial periods over hundreds of thousands of years? It's simple. During colder periods, more of the lighter O16 is locked up in ice sheets, leaving relatively higher concentrations of O18 in ocean water. On the other hand, during warmer periods, the ice sheets begin to melt. This process releases O16 into the ocean, affecting the O18-O16 ratio of the water. Marine organisms that build shells from ocean water capture this isotope ratio, and when they die, their shells settle on the ocean floor, forming layers of sediment. Therefore, by studying O18-O16 ratios in marine sediments and ice cores, scientists can reconstruct ancient climates. These records show us that over the last 800,000 years, Earth has cycled through glacial and interglacial periods due to natural factors. However, what's new today is the rate of change. The current rate of warming is far steeper than anything seen in those natural cycles. What took thousands of years to occur in the past is now happening over just a few decades. And this is where human influence becomes clear. Topic two of the climate cluster is grouped into three major areas, natural variability, human-induced causes, and impacts on both natural and human systems. By understanding the scientific principles behind these, you'll be able to explain observed climate patterns logically in your exam responses. Let's begin by exploring the natural causes of climate change. How does the Earth's climate go through cycles of warming and cooling naturally? First, let's look at the Earth's orbit and tilt. The Milankovitch cycles describe how the Earth's orbit changes shape from circular to elliptical roughly every 100,000 years, and how the tilt of the Earth's axis shifts between 21.5 degrees and 24.5 degrees every 41,000 years. These changes alter the amount of solar energy reaching Earth, especially at the poles, triggering long-term shifts like ice ages. Next, sunspot activity on the sun's surface observe an 11-year cycle. Sunspots, often observed as dark spots on the sun's surface, are cooler regions where heat is prevented from flowing to the surface. 
the surrounding areas of sunspots often radiate more solar energy to compensate the lower temperatures at the sunspots. Every 11 years, sunspot activities will peak, where more sunspots are observed. During this period, the surrounding areas of the sunspots radiate more solar energy. These solar radiation then travel through space to reach the Earth's surface, raising Earth's temperatures. Lastly, large-scale volcanic eruptions play a role in naturally altering global temperatures. Explosive eruptions, like the 1991 Mount Pinatubo eruption in the Philippines, inject large amounts of sulfur dioxide and ash into the atmosphere. These particles that are suspended in the atmosphere have the ability to reflect solar radiation back to space. Therefore, after such large-scale volcanic eruptions, there can be temporary global cooling until the particles eventually settle. Now, it is important to recognize that while natural factors explain long-term historical climate shifts, they cannot account for the accelerated warming observed in the past century. So, what is the main driver of today's climate crisis? To understand this, we will first have to unpack the role of greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is a natural process where greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane trap some of the Earth's outgoing long-wave radiation, keeping the planet warm enough for life. But human activities such as the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas can release excessive greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. This leads to the enhanced greenhouse effect, where too much heat is trapped, causing global temperatures to rise at an unprecedented rate. The current phase of climate change is driven primarily by human activities. To understand these anthropogenic factors, we must first recognize the global phenomenon observed over the last century. As the world's population grows, especially in developing countries, so does the demand for housing, transport, food, and energy. Alongside this, rapid economic development in countries like Brazil, Russia, India, and China has fueled industrialization and increased energy consumption. This dual pressure of population and economic growth leads to changing land use patterns. Deforestation is practiced to make space to fulfill the needs of the growing population. Trees, which naturally absorb carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, are either removed or burned. This not only releases stored carbon into the atmosphere, but also reduces the Earth's ability to remove CO2, contributing directly to the enhanced greenhouse effect. In addition to deforestation, expanding cities also play a critical role. As people migrate from rural to urban areas in search of better opportunities, countries experience rapid urbanization. This often involves clearing land for developments that increases surface temperatures through urban heat island effect and increased energy consumption. Most of the energy used in these cities comes from the burning of fossil fuels, which emit large amounts of greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. This chain reaction, from population growth to land conversion, urbanization, and increased fossil fuel use, all contributes to rising greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. These human-induced changes are happening at a much faster pace than the Earth's natural systems can adapt to making this phase of climate change particularly dangerous and urgent. Here's a quick exam tip. When asked about causes of climate change, don't just list keywords and activities. Show the connections. For example, population growth leads to changing land use, which demands deforestation, which then drives increased greenhouse gas emissions. This demonstrates geographical understanding beyond content recall. Now that we have understood the causes of climate change, let's dive into its impacts. Climate change has profound impacts on the Earth's natural systems, specifically the oceans, forests, weather patterns, and biodiversity. Rising temperatures affect atmospheric and oceanic circulation. Oceans absorb over 90% of the heat trapped by greenhouse gases, causing sea surface temperatures to rise. This affects marine ecosystems and can slow down ocean currents like the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, AMOC in short, which redistributes heat across the globe. Coral reefs are particularly vulnerable. When ocean temperatures rise even slightly, corals expel the algae living in them, causing coral bleaching. Bleached corals lose their color and their main source of food, and many die if stress continues. Increased carbon dioxide also causes ocean acidification, reducing the availability of calcium carbonate, which marine organisms need for their shells and skeletons. On land, ecosystems are also shifting. Many species are migrating toward the poles or higher altitudes. However, not all can adapt or move. 
Droughts caused by increased evaporation weaken plants and reduce food availability for animals. Floods from excessive rainfall can wash away soil, habitats, and even animals. Besides the natural system, humans are deeply affected by climate change as well, both directly and indirectly. Direct impacts include more frequent and severe heat waves, floods, wildfires, droughts, and tropical cyclones. For instance, the 2003 European heat wave killed over 70,000 people. The 2020 floods in Bangladesh affected over 1.3 billion homes and displaced thousands. These disasters strain resources, displace populations, and deepen inequality. Indirect impacts come from the disruption of ecosystem services. For example, food production is affected when fish migrate or crop yields decline due to erratic weather. This can significantly affect food security and livelihoods of populations working in the agricultural sector. One example would be in Cambodia, where unpredictable rainfall has reduced water levels of the Tonle Sap Lake, and this drastically reduced fish supply, threatening livelihoods. Health risks are rising too, as warmer climates enable the spread of vector-borne diseases like dengue and malaria into new areas. In Bhutan, warmer conditions allowed mosquitoes to thrive in highland areas previously too cold for them. Besides, there are also cultural losses. In the Arctic, melting ice has altered traditional Inuit practices, such as food storage and transportation using sled dogs. In tourism, hotspots like the Maldives, coral bleaching, and sea level rise threaten both ecosystems and income sources. The economic costs of rebuilding after climate disasters are straining national budgets, especially in less developed countries. That's a lot of information, isn't it? To do well, your goal shouldn't just be memorizing terms like greenhouse gases or ocean acidification. Focus on explaining how and why things happen and back up your points with clear, well-chosen examples. Start by building understanding through visuals. Use annotated diagrams for processes like the greenhouse effect and draw your own flowcharts to connect causes to effects. This helps you retain big ideas and see the chain of causation. For example, flowcharts can show how urbanization leads to more fossil fuel use, which increases emissions and accelerates warming. Next, practice structured questions regularly. Start with description questions such as, describe the effects of climate change on natural systems. Then build up to higher order explanation or evaluation questions. For level descriptor questions, LDQs, always plan before writing. During your revision, prepare arguments and case studies to address both sides of perspective. Build a case study bank with details and data you can pull out quickly during exams. Finally, reflect on feedback from your teacher. What kinds of questions are you losing marks on? Is it a lack of clarity, weak examples, or not addressing the question directly? Adjust your revision around those gaps. With consistent practice, clear frameworks, and a strong grasp of cause-effect relationships, you'll be well-prepared not just for the examination, but for real-world conversations about climate and sustainability. Finally, feel free to head to thatgeographyteacher.com to access various resources from Cluster Content Breakdown, to my written guidebook, to articles that broaden your perspective on learning, as well as link to my custom AI tool. Hope you'll enjoy the process of learning and see you in the next video.